Hello everyone. Today we will complete the nephrotic syndrome and its case presentation, its remaining part. Okay, we have uh, completed till our history of present illness. Today we will go on with our past history. In past history, you will be asking about any similar episodes in the past. Were there any similar episodes in the past? If so, what was the treatment given there? And how many times the episode has been recorded? That is recurrence of the episode and interval between the recurrence of episode. So once you present the case of the similar episode has been present, next your questions will be all about the remission, relapse, recurrence, uh, dependence and resistance. Okay. So starting with the nephrotic syndrome definition. Your viva question starts from here. What is a triad of nephrotic syndrome? So, triad of nephrotic syndrome will be heavy proteinuria. Next will be hypoproteinemia and edema. So, we will go into the detail of each of these. When do you call it as heavy proteinuria or nephrotic range proteinuria? So, when you call it as heavy proteinuria, it is when your urine dipstick test. So, when your urine dipstick test shows 3 plus to 4 plus range proteinuria. Second, when the urine protein is to urine creatine ratio, when the urine protein is to urine creatine ratio is more than 2 milligram per milligram. Third, or when the 24 hour urine protein is more than 40 milligram per meter square per hour. So, uh, these are the definitions to tell that the child is having a heavy proteinuria or nephrotic range proteinuria. These sample will be taken when uh, the first morning urine samples. Okay. Second definition, when you call it as hypoproteinemia. So, in the previous guidelines or in your Nelson textbook, it is when the serum albumin is less than 2.5 gram per deciliter according to your new recommendations okay according to the new guidelines it is when the serum albumin is less than 3 gram per deciliter you call this as hypoproteinemia okay so first you have finished heavy, heavy proteinuria hypoproteinemia next is edema so edema is when will you see a clinical edema that is bilateral pedal edema, ascites, uh, facial puffiness or periorbital puffiness. When can you visualize a clinical edema? So that will be your question. So or what is clinical edema? So edema is visible when there is an increase in the child's body weight by 3 to 5 percentage. So when the edema is visible. When there is 3 to 5 percentage, okay. When there is 3 to 5 percentage increase in body weight, okay. Then you call it as or you can find the clinical edema or edema will be visible to you. So, how will you manage edema? So, when the child comes with edema, uh, how will you going to manage and how are you going to classify edema? So, you so, next will be classification of edema. So, they can ask viva questions like, so you have known the previous weight, that is dry weight of the child you know have known already or the baseline weight of the child you have known already and how we are going to classify edema according to the weight. So, you can classify it as mild edema, moderate edema, and severe edema okay you call it as mild edema when there is an increase in the body weight from the baseline of less than or seven equal to seven percent when the baseline body weight increases from less than or equal to seven percentage it is mild edema moderate is when there is increase in the body weight from eight to fifteen percentage it is moderate severe is more than fifteen percentage increase in the body weight Okay, so this is how you classify edema and how are you going to treat this edema? Next question will be. 
so be when a child presents to you with edema you have to assess for its hypovolemia first so you straight away you can't tell the answer like for mild edema i'm going to give so and so treatment for moderate i'm going to give so and so treatment first you have to start with that initial thing you have to assess for hypovolemia so clinically what are the features you can see in clinical signs in uh, hypovolemia it will be abdominal pain the child can have abdominal pain vomiting lethargy next will be crp will be prolonged third there will be cold peripheries or cold extremities there will be low pulse volume Yeah, the child's BP will be low. A child can have postural hypotension. So these are the features to tell that the child is having hypovolemia. So when the child is uh, having hypovolemia, you have to give treatment accordingly, even if there is edema. If there is no hypovolemia, so when there is no hypovolemia, then how were you going to treat that child? For mild edema, then there is no need for lasics. you have to give diet diet uh, modification that is you should not add extra salt that is no added salt second will be steroid you have to start with the steroid treatment the steroid itself act as the diuresis for this child okay next for moderate for moderate and severe edema how are you going to treat so we will start with diet modification that is no added salt second you will start on steroid third you will be giving oral lasix that is oral furosemide will be started at the dose of 1 to 4 mg per kg per day okay next when you start of oral furosemide when can you expect the diuresis in this child so next question will be when can you expect diuresis in this child after starting your furosemide it is within 2 to 3 hours you can expect diuresis so it is within 2 to 3 hours of starting oral furosemide you can expect diuresis or up to maximum of 4 hours you can wait if the child is not having enough urine output when there is no response then what you do you can add on spironolactone it is a uh, potassium sparing diuretic you can add on spironolactone at the dose of 2 to 3 mg per kg per day one suppose if there is no response to this then what to do you can add on thiazide diuretics so you can add on that is thiazide diuretics like hydrochlor thiazide at the dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg per day or you can start on with iv furosemide so you can start off with iv furosemide at the dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg bolus dose so you can give 1 to 2 mg per kg of iv furosemide followed by infusion followed by furosemide infusion at the rate of so at the rate of 0.1 to 0.4 mg per kg per hour okay if the child is even refractory to this the child is even refractory to this iv furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide then you give iv albumin that is iv 20% h albumin is being started at the dose of so what is the dose of albumin it is 0.5 to 1 g per kg you give this over 4 hours at the end of this albumin you have to give furosemide so why this albumin is given over 4 hours duration is so you have to give this 20 percentage albumin slowly because the child can develop any allergic reactions to albumin or the child can develop fluid overload state so you are giving it in a cautious manner followed by lasix at the end of this albumin infusion so this is about the treatment of edema okay next
next we'll go on to its definitions next they'll be asking uh, you have uh, i mean now uh, you have told the child is having previous similar episode then what is the definition of remission so we'll go on with the definitions so when you call the child is having a remission when the urine protein so when the urine protein uh, you are doing a dipstick method so you are checking the urine protein by dipstick method when it is nil or in a trace amount or when the urine protein by urine creatinine ratio is less than 0.2 mg per mg for three consecutive days for three consecutive early morning urine specimen for three consecutive early morning urine sample then you call it as remission okay when will you call it as relapse in relapse we have two that is frequent relapse and infrequent relapse i'll go in detail later so when will you call it as relapse so when the urine protein by dipstick method this dipstick method is more than 3 plus more than or equal to 3 plus or when the urine protein by urine creatinine ratio is more than or equal to 2 mg per mg in for three consecutive days same thing okay for three consecutive days in the early morning urine specimen once uh, the child initially have been in remission previously so having been in remission previously okay so when do you call the child is having a frequent relapse so when do you child tell the child is having a frequent relapse is when there is more than or equal to two relapse in the first six month period in the first six month period after stopping your steroid therapy after stopping the initial therapy or and there is more than or equal to 3 relapse in any 6 month period or when there is more than or equal to 4 relapse in 1 year you call this as child is having a frequent relapse that is more than or equal to two relapse in first six months after stopping the initial therapy or more than or equal to three relapse in any six months or more than or equal to four relapse in one year period you call the child is having a frequent relapse next definition will be dependence when you call this child as having steroid dependence okay that is when the two consecutive relapse or alternate uh, when there is a child is having a two consecutive relapse on uh, uh, alternate day steroid when the child is taking an alternate day steroid therapy or within 14 days of discontinuation of the steroid that is when there is two consecutive relapse on alternate day steroid when the child is on alternate day steroid or within 14 days of its discontinuation okay then you call it as steroid dependence next is when you call the child is having a steroid resistance okay so the definition of steroid resistant is lack of complete res, uh, remission despite the therapy with daily prednisolone at the dose of 2 mg per kg per day for 6 weeks. That is lack of complete res, uh, remission despite therapy with daily prednisolone okay at the dose of 
टू एम जी पर के जी पर डे फॉर सिक्स वीक्स देन यू कॉल दिस चाइल्ड इज हैविंग स्टेरॉइड रेसिस्टेंस ओके सो दिस इज अ द डेफिनेशन ऑफ रेमिशन रिलैप्स फ्रीक्वेंट रिलैप्स स्टेरॉइड डिपेंडेंस एंड स्टेरॉइड रेसिस्टेंस सो वी हैव फिनिश्ड द पास्ट हिस्ट्री एंड द पॉसिबल वाइव ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट दे कैन बी आस्ड इन योर दिस पास्ट हिस्ट्री साइड नेक्स्ट वील गो ऑन विद द एंटीनेटल हिस्ट्री Next will be your antenatal history. So you have to tell tell gravity of the mother, age of the mother. Third will be registered and immunized pregnancy. How many A N visits the mother has been taken? Whether she have taken all the supplements. Okay. whether there was any history of fever with rash okay seventh whether there was radiation exposure so next they can ask what for what you are asking fever with rash so to rule out torch infections okay next How come torch infection can contribute to nephrotic syndrome? Will be your next question. Your congenital ne- uh, we have discussed about the congenital nephrotic syndrome. We have discussed the primary causes of congenital nephrotic syndrome and what is the secondary causes for congenital nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so here I will tell you. So secondary causes for congenital nephrotic syndrome. So, what are the secondary causes of congenital nephrotic syndrome? One can be urinary infections like congenital syphilis. Second, toxoplasmosis. Third, CMV. Fourth, rubella. Fifth will be hepatitis B and C. So, these can cause sec. These are can be the secondary causes of congenital syphilis. So for that, to rule out that, I am asking the question of fever with rash to a mother. Next, you will be asking whether mother has P A H, G D M, hypothyroidism. Whether she have done all the anti, I mean antenatal scan, anomaly scan, and it is how many scans she have been undergone. In that scan, whether the liker was normal or whether she knows anything about liker, whether they have told the polyhydramnios or uh, uh, oligohydramnios in our uh, uh, liker stage. Polyhydramnios can be present uh, when the child has uh, congenital nephrotic syndrome, so that can be a clue. So when the child, when the mother has this polyhydramnios, this can be a clue that the child can have congenital nephrotic syndrome. Okay. so this is about your antenatal history next will be your birth history in birth history it will be whether term child or preterm child second normal vaginal delivery or through lscs cried immediately after birth what was the birth weight of the child breastfeeding done immediately after the uh, uh, delivery or how many uh, hours after the delivery a uh, breastfeeding and whether the child had any nicu admission okay this can be the other questions next will be your family history in family history as usual when you have started it will be with the first born second born or third born child second will be through consanguineous marriage or non consanguineous marriage whether there was any history of renal disease in the family or any early death or whether there was any recurrent